for some reason. <laughs> but uh, James, thanks for coming on again. Obviously, for anybody watching this, we've already done this before, and uh, for some reason it didn't work. All I can do is blame Gav since he's our mutual friend. <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's that was always that was always our go-to. It's just like you know what's went wrong, Gav. Aye, Gav, so what you done? <laughs> I, I don't know what happened, but I'm blaming Gav. It's it's fully his fault, and uh, he'll need to take full responsibility for it. But second time, it's going to be even better than the first time. Let, let's put it that way. Aye, I hope so, mate. I hope so. And just just as you said that, something came up on my screen saying reconnecting. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. Um, so, James, we'll kind of go through. You know the setup, right? So, yeah, yeah. We'll, right back to the very beginning. I deleted your episodes. So I don't know any of these uh, these answers to these questions. So that's a good thing, right? <laughs> so, going right back to the very start, where were you brought up, James? And what music were you into? Music when you were a wee kid growing up. I was brought up in a place called Bog Hall. I don't know if you've ever heard it, Ian, but... Um, sounds stunning. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it sounds stunning. I, um, I, we like to call it East Bathgate, um, but it's, <laughs> it's a wee sort of town on its own called Bog Hall, and uh, there's, there's nothing there. I mean, Bathgate's the nearest town, but uh, there was a social club in, in uh, Bog Hall, but I can never remember being sort of part of any kind of... Uh, Sort of music groups. There was no music groups or anything like that where where I grew up in. The same as like uh, even at the gala days. Now you get gala day tents with bands and stuff, and I can never remember that when I was younger. So was music pretty- didn't re- and music didn't really play a big part in my life. Sort of for the first like, 10, 10, 12 years anyway. It sounded like you only had two things, which was a bog and a hall. <laughs> there was a hall there. I I remember going to a few discos there actually. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and uh, it's I don't know where I think I think there's a peat bog over the back here, which is where the, the bog came from. But so James, I don't know where the hole the hole came from. What what got you into music then? Like what what age were you when you discovered your own musical taste, and what type of bands was it that you were discovering? Um, <clears throat> earliest memories of music and what um, I don't know if you remember for the last time, but. Uh, there used to be a cupboard in our living room that had uh, records in it, and I remember pulling the records out, and yeah. one one of them was Shawadi Wadi. <laughs> yeah. um, and I just remember thinking, what's this? And you seen the guitars and the drums, and um, I, for some reason, I can't ever remember having a record player, though. Um, so we had, these, we had these records. It's one of the things where I think, you know, the, the record player probably broken. My mum and dad just didn't want to chuck the records out or give them away to anybody. So um, that was my first thought on music was that seeing these records, and then my dad used to play uh, Billy Joel records or right. Billy Joel tapes or whatever. Um, and I, that's my earliest memory of music is, is sort of hearing Billy Joel playing and my dad singing at the top of his lungs. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, you you're talking about finding like your parents record collection and you're flicking through it now I've done this exact same thing but it was going up the loft and there was a box of records and it's similar to yourself um, you know it would have been years since my parents had a record player you know it would have been that thing where it either got broke or it got replaced probably with CDs or whatever it was but you're still investigating when you're younger and you're flicking through all these records and I can remember pulling them out and you know, you've got the, it's obviously the big sleeve, and the, you know back then especially artwork was so important because it helped to sell the, the album. And I always remember it was a um, Pinball Wizard by by the Who, and it was obviously like on the front cover. There's like the pinball machine there on the back of it, or uh, either the back of it, or you open it up and the thing's exploding. Who <laughs> must have got like a, a few cherry bombs near it or something like that, but. Um, and there's loads of people probably done the same, just flicking through their, their mum and dad's record collection. And and, you, and you're just looking for something that looks cool. You don't even know uh, what it is. But uh, what were some of the bands that you kind of got into then, moving forward a wee bit, maybe when you're hitting your teens? Um, <clears throat> it was the... Uh, I, I, again, mate, I, I wasn't really into music. I went and done... 
I was done drama when I was younger. I was my mum sent me to the youth theatre to to try and get me out my shell a bit, yeah. <laughs> and um, I was uh, into the youth theatre maybe for like about eleven till about fourteen or something. I'll tell you what the first thing that I kind of remember the first spark as as it was was uh, the Britannia Music Club. Uh, again, we sort of spoke about this the last time, but they send out a CD every month, and if you didn't like it, you send it back. And it's one of these things where they hope you didn't send it back, or you, you can't be bothered sending it back. So they've made themselves sort of twelve quid <laughs> with the CD. But I remember <clears throat> the Britannia CD coming through, and my mum opening it and going, "Oh, what's this?" And then kind of threw it down. And later on, I went to look at it, and it was Queen Live Magic, which I think was. Uh, one of their concerts uh, live at Wembley, possibly late 80s. And uh, I remember just out of curiosity sticking it on and um, being blown away by it. Like, right. you know, it was, it was a light bulb moment. It was like, what the hell is this? Um, and then I just like, it's cover to cover. Cover to cover, like I listened to that cover. To, I say cover to cover, it's not a, it wasn't a vinyl, but I listened to it one end to the other on repeat. And then the CDs, like obviously when they started coming through, um, I would I would listen to them. So I think I think the next one, right? <laughs> Don't laugh. Was Erasure Wild, right? Okay. And uh, I popped that in, and obviously that's a bit bit different be, uh, for Queen. But I mean, God, can Andy Bell sing? Um, what a voice on him as well, and uh, pop. Pop tunes, Ian, and I just, I got hooked on that as well, and uh, I loved it, and again, I listened to that on repeat, and then just, the CDs just started coming through, there was, uh, for some reason, a Cat Stevens one came through, yep. and again, still a big fan to this day, so, such an eclectic mix, you know what I mean, and and, and that's that was my first foray into to music, was dis- discovering that, uh, discovering that Queen CD, probably when I was about 12 or 13, mate. The other thing I suppose as well though is uh, you're doing a bit of youth theatre or you know whatever it was called okay it's it's not it's more probably acting rather than musical but it's giving you the confidence to perform in front of people which probably does you well later in life when you're doing the music of course I I mean um youth theatre was three years and then for some reason on the I think on the fourth year they used to have a, like a summer camp where they basically just put on a camp for four weeks uh, yep. during the summer holidays and they would write and do a production and then perform it at the end. They would do it in like the Regal and Bathgate or like one of the school sort of gym halls and they would, I don't know, charge for tickets and stuff. But in the fourth year, they didn't run it for some reason and, and I ended up going to one by the Scottish Opera Uh and I mean, it's no, no, it's no like opera, opera. They, it was like they put on a musical, and I don't know how I managed to get one of the lead roles in it because I remember there being about thirty or forty kids there, um, and I'd never done music in my life. But there must have been some, you know what I mean? They must have seen something where they were like, "What, uh, this- what musical was it? Do you remember?" It was uh, <clears throat> The Untouchables. It was a musical version of The Untouchables. Was it Elliot Ness was like the lead character in that, and it was about gangsters back in the, the 20s and 30s or something. But what happened was they actually, they had like a musical director there, and they sat for the first week and sort of wrote songs with all the students, and everybody would kind of pitch in and give their ideas and things like that. So... Uh, it's not as if it was a con- a concept that was already there. They kind of, they'd done it all over the four week period. They wrote it from start to finish and rehearsed it and, and then ended up performing it. And I remember getting a wee write up in the, the local courier. Uh, I'm sure my mum's still got it up the loft somewhere where it's like me with this hat and the waistcoat and the, the kid on machine gun and these sort of two girls with the you know, the, the, the short hair with the, the headbands, like, for the, the 20s or 30s or whatever. But Was it just, like, bog hall legend to be? <laughs> bog hall leg end. 
Uh, no, I was. Uh, I can't remember what the headline was, mate. I, I, I could look it out, like, but um, maybe somewhere up my mum's loft somewhere. <laughs> you're doing that probably early teens. You don't realise it at the time, but you're maybe getting your confidence through that. You're discovering music later mm. on. Was guitar your first instrument? No, drums. Um, I started off on drums for a good seven, eight years. Um, the story kind of goes, mate, as a as I hit around about 15, my mum had me working in the local um, restaurant washing dishes. She was always very like, you know, you will if you want the good stuff, you will earn. You know, I mean, I'm no... She, she's like a single mother with three kids. <laughs> she's like, you're, the, you're not getting the Adidas trainers. I can't afford them. You'll get the... You'll get the uh, I can't remember. This is one with pound stretchers. Um, but okay, the really fancy ones that have got an extra stripe. <laughs> aye, aye, the, four, the Adidas four stripes. So, um, Ian, I was working, so uh, they took me in on like a Thursday night after school, washing dishes six till nine, and then they're like, fancy a wee shift at the at the weekend, and I'd day like a ten till six. So I'm like 15, mate, and I'm sort of earning 50, 60 quid a week. Can I like, what did I do this one? Like, I'm buying all the trainers and all the good gear and all that. And then that way when you've got, like, 10 pair of trainers and, like, 10 hoodies and you're like, what else can I buy? And my cousin's um, my cousin's boyfriend at the time was selling one of these wee four-pad electronic drum machines. You know, the wee do 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 like, And they've got a wee display on them with, like, conga beats and all that that you can jam along with. So, I don't know, you sell money them for like 20, 30 quid or something like that, and I'm like, ah, I've got plenty of money, give me, give me that here. Yeah. So, I, I just sat in my room for about a week, and then uh, my mate says to me, he phoned me up, and he's like, my brother's just gave me a bass guitar, bring your drum machine down, and we'll, uh, Create and we'll get a wee jam. Yeah. We'll get a jam. So, we were sitting in his room, just making an absolute racket. Kelly had never played the drums, he'd never played the bass, but we were just making a racket. And uh, we heard a whistle and I looked out the window and there was two guys standing, two gardens doing with the guitars, like <laughs> looking up and we're like, open the window, what's going on? And they're like, are you just playing drums? Aye. They're like, we're having a jam down here, come down and have a jam with us, bring your drums down. And then that was it, mate, honestly, it was like something, like something for a film. Um, and we ended up in this wee shed, man, it must have been like, six by five or something like the four years crammed in drum machine based we were all plugged into the one amp including yeah. the, the microphones get what i mean we plugged into the one amp and uh we became a band and uh we were a band for like six seven years and that's where what? i that's where i done my time that's where i learned my trade what was your band name we were called the haze to start with right How, uh, that so we were the haze we were the haze for like about six, seven years, and um, <clears throat> we kind of got into our tw- 20s, maybe 22, 23, and then we just went our separate ways. King guys start sort of getting engaged, and we've not got enough time for the band and, and things like that. So it, it came to a natural end, and we all stayed friends, but no. Yeah. And um, when did you start doing like, were, were you. Was, playing in pubs were you doing gigs with that band or was that something that came later I mean we were we were totally hurting ourselves about uh, anywhere that would take us our front man was a total um, what's the word I'm looking for he was a charlatan but he had the charm so he used to like he used to like phone up like places in Glasgow and that and be like uh, we're looking for a gig uh, we can bring a bus for a folk and obviously the promoters would be like that Yes. Come along, man. Come along. We'll put you on. Uh, they were seeing. They were seeing pound signs, and then we'd turn up like we wouldn't know this, and we'd turn up to the gig, and the promoter would be up after about can maybe ten, fifteen minutes after the doors open. When's your When's your folk coming? And Andy's like, they'll be on their way. They're up. They're on their way, man. They're on the bus now. And then like half an hour would go by, and and Andy would be pulling out the the mobile phone, and I, what? You You broke down on the motorway. You're, you're joking me. You buddy, they broke down in the motorway. <laughs> so that's an absolute redneck. So you never knew what was uh, what was going to happen at a gig. Um, but we, like, in Bathgate, we had literally 
played every pub. We were really well known, sort of Bathgate, maybe West Lothian, um, because we were playing every weekend, uh, and so, sort of as far afield as, as Edinburgh and Glasgow at the time. But uh, aye, we, we gigged ourselves to death. Aye. So obviously, you played with the band. The band kind of came to its natural end. Did you kind of just plod on? solo after that or did you do other bands what, what did you kind of do up into the kind of the point that you're at just now because I know you were in uh, we were joking earlier about about Gav who, who's a mutual friend so I know that was uh, you were in a band together myself and Gav played in a band when we were teenagers just before the war it was that long ago <laughs> and, uh, and Gav, Gav still would have been in his 40s then <laughs> I'm not kidding you, he looks exactly the same. He must be drinking some sort of weird blood concoction or something. That He doesn't seem to age the guy, it's crazy. <laughs> and, uh, and he still does recording for me. Now we still kind of got a couple of bands that we do music recording, but was your next big band the band that, that Gav was in? Aye, aye. Well, I mean, like I say, it was so, I can't remember, maybe 24, 25, uh, that, that band broke up. And I'd been thinking about on guitar for a, a while with the guys in between rehearsals and, you know, when, when everybody's down in tools and going out for a fag and that, I'd be picking up the guitar and yep. getting them to show me chords and things. So I, I sort of had started knowing my way around about the guitar and I'd started writing songs in the band. Um, and, you know, that obviously when the drummer starts writing songs, that was doing like a lead balloon, as we all know, but... Um, I started getting better, and I think maybe about 10 or 11 songs in, they eventually went, that's quite good, that one. That's, what, what were they chords? Yeah. You know, and then you're just, your heart bursts with pride. And so um, I'd, I'd started already writing songs while I was in the haze, but when they, when that finished, um, that's when I really started ramping it up because, you know, I'd no critics. Um, I was my own biggest critic, and I'd learned a lot for, for the, the songwriters that I'd... The guys in the haze, they were, still to this day, I think, were, were brilliant songwriters. And yep. uh, so I, I kind of went solo, mate, and just started recording my own stuff and going out and doing open mics and then sort of doing opening slots for bands and things like that as, as an acoustic act for a good long time. Yep. And then, um, I, it must have been about talking six, seven years ago now that... Uh, I went to buy an amp for Gav um, for, for just doing a bit of, re bit of recording and Gav, as we know, knows everybody and what, what are you doing with yourself? I'm like, oh, I'm just sort of writing, recording, doing a bit of gigging. Are you on a band? <laughs> That's my impression of Gav, by the way. Um, I, I, if you know him, it's spot on. Uh, I was like... <laughs> Yeah, it says, no, I'm not in a band. He's like, I know a guy that's putting a band together and he's looking for a singer. He's a guitarist, uh, but he's looking to sort of put a band together. And I was like, oh, what well, have I got to lose? So that was Christian Cleese. I don't know if you know Christian or not. Um, but I sent him out a couple of demos that I'd worked on and he came back. He's like, love it. Have you got any mayor? Sent him some mayor. And he's like, I love them too. When, uh, when can we get together and have a jam? So... I think by the time I met, they'd already got Gavin and possibly, um, oh, I'm, I'm thinking he got, there was two Gavs in the band. Let me rewind a bit. Let me rewind a bit. You're talking about Gav Hines. Yes. I'm ah, talking about, right, I'm, right. Damn. I'm talking, <laughs> I'm talking about Mr. Iron Maiden. Mr. Iron Maiden. Right, so in Cyanar, there was uh, there was two Gavs. So there was Gav Hines and there was Gav Mills. And right. the Gav that I have been ripping is Gav Mills. Right, okay. The one that I... I mean, I love, I love Gav Mills to bits, but Gav, Gav Hines, is, oh, what a, he's a total legend. Total legend. Boundless energy and uh, I'm nothing, but, nothing but good things to, to say. About Gavin, loads of good memories for the band. They've been literally all our gigs was just like totally buzzing off of Gav bouncing about the stage like a, like a gummy bear. It's just that thing with, with Gav Hines is that uh, you're pay, you're, you're, even the band, you're playing sort of pop rock, but you've still got Steve Harris machine gun bass at the bottom. <laughs> Gav, Gav, Gav is just Iron, Mr. Iron Maiden through and through. 
It's funny because that that band was a total mishmash of uh, of characters. I mean, obviously, you've got Gav Hines, who was uh, Mister Iron Maiden himself, and yeah. then Christian. He kind of he was a big Nuno Betancourt fan, so um, he he had then four guitar and like was very technical in his approach to things, whereas. I mean, I'm I'm the, the singer, the front man, the guy who's writing the songs. I can't have to play chords. I can't tell you what notes are in them. You know, I know the formations of the fingers, yeah. and I can sing in tune to them, but when it comes to any kind of music theory, I'm out. So um, that was sort of a, a big divide as well. And then you've got Gav um, Mills, who uh, he likes so, more, more sort of classic rock, you know, your seventies your and possibly getting into some of the the hair stuff in the eighties. Yep. So, and I mean, I just, I'm, I would consider myself as a sort of pop writer, if you like, pop rock writer. Um, so it was an interesting. There was there was a few clashing clashing heads when it came to direction, but it all seemed to work out in the end. So, James, how how do you go about? You're just talking about being the main songwriter for the band how do you go about writing a song what what is your method what's your process for writing a song is it is it generally the same for each song that you write the, the same process <coughs> pretty much mate it's um it's either guitar or piano um i've got a piano at my desk here so i just sort of pull it out and tinker away or yeah. I, I pick up the acoustic um and it starts with chords, mate. So I normally just find three or four chords that I like, and then I start humming a song or humming a tune. Sorry. Um, and I've seen a lot of sing uh, songwriters do it, where they just kind of come up with verbal diarrhea, just yeah. throw words in, and it didn't make any sense. But it, like you, you know, you might fling out two lines and. I don't know, um, maybe two or three of the words will go will stick. You'll be like, oh, man, I quite like how the, I phrased that there. And it's came from anywhere. And then you maybe start building the song around about that idea or those words. But it's, aye, it's so it's chords and melodies and then the words come later. It's interesting. I mean, everybody is different about how they write, but I'm probably similar to yourself. I'll pick up the guitar. And it'll, it'll maybe, depending if it's the rock stuff or if it's the, the stuff that's maybe less rock, you know, but um, it's always like the guitar that starts out. And then, similar to yourself, I, I'll maybe, it'll either be humming a vocal melody or it'll be, I'll have one random sort of phrase that it'll probably not even end up in the song, but I'll, that'll be just sat, <laughs> sang on beat to kind of get the idea of, this is how I kind of want the words to fit uh, the vocal melody, but the lyrics always come last for me. And uh, I know some people, it's completely the other way around. There'll be people that will write and write and write. They'll have books of stuff, of, of words written. I, ca I can't seem to do that. It just, you know, I'll do it very occasionally, but it gen usually it will not turn into a song. It usually gets forgotten. Usually I've got to do the music first, lyrics come last. But uh, but to me personally, music and lyrics, the lyrics are just as important as the music. Is that kind of how you view it for yourself? I, I'm, I'm very particular about the lyrics. Um, <coughs> very, up until very recently, I've always kind of wrote um, for, for personal experience. Um, I've never... You know how like Lennon McCartney can write like Eleanor Rigby picks up yeah. the right. So you know that like I, I could never do that. Like it was I could only ever write for experience. And more recently than no, um, I started messing about with writing from experience, but try to dis disguise the the meaning if that makes any sense. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you if if I was to go read your lyrics without hearing the music would it be obvious to me what you were singing about would it tell a, a pretty straightforward story or is it a little bit sort of a little bit more vague um <clears throat> no I think 
I think there might be the odd line in there. It's like, you know, what the hell is that? Um, I remember I, I was at a gig a few weeks ago, sort of doing Gala Shields, and uh, there's a, there's a girl in there, Jasmine. She uh, she's my biggest fan. She always comes up. I'm your biggest fan, James. I'm your biggest fan. Uh, and she introduced me to her granddad, who was at the gig as well. And he's like, uh, he says to me, he says, I like your song, uh, Cassie. I was like, oh, I, could, uh, that, I think I released that in January. And that was one of the ones I tried to think outside the box a bit when I, when I was singing, um, yeah. when I was writing. And he's like, what were you on when you wrote that? <laughs> You're and, like my child. <laughs> And, and part of me, you know, for the first for the split first split second, I was offended, and then then I was like, "Oh, that's great," because like people think it's possibly a bit weird compared to what I've I've done before, and and, and that was the point. And I think there was there's one of the lines in it um, where the song's about sort of going out, out on a drive with a girl that you fancy, and then the car breaks down, and she's been a total drama queen. Um, like what happens if nobody finds us out here and I think one of the lines is uh, if no one finds us then we'll die and pretty seagulls will peck our eyes <laughs> and I just, yeah. <laughs> just I was trying I was trying to weird it out a bit I was trying to be a bit like folk folk would think what? did he just say <laughs> if no one finds us then we'll die and pretty seagulls will peck our eyes um, but th- that was the whole point was to sort of come out my comfort zone a bit and, and try and I mean it's hardly daring you know it's no kicking down the boundaries of literacy or anything like that but for me it kind of was um, I, like, I mean I've got another song that I wrote um, a song called Violet um, and that was about drink or having, a, having an issue with drink when I was a bit younger in my I remember when I told you I was sort of living at my dad's and uh, life, life was totally peachy. It was just like, let's get a carry out. Tuesday night, let's get a carry out. Um, and then, like, so, you know, you're, maybe your mum's saying to you, so I seem to be drinking off your lot, son. And I'm like, no, no, I'll be fine. But then you, you you kind of think to yourself, maybe, maybe I'm drinking a bit. So I wrote a sort of a love letter or a goodbye letter to alcohol and called it Violet. But... Um, I made out as if it was a like a person. Yeah. Aye, aye. <laughs> um, the uh, try to think. Of, you know, try to remember the words. Violet, <laughs> you know I love you, but I'm gonna leave you here with your friends, cause I know they love you more than I do. On you they depend. <laughs> So um, it was kind of, I was addressing it to like a, a, a person. Um, yeah. And I remember at the time, uh, people come up to me going, who's Violet? Because I was single at the time, like, Who, who's Violet? <laughs> that, that, that's the cool thing about music though, is that it can mean something different to each person that, uh, that listens to it. But that, that's what I like about, about songs like that. I always remember one of my favourite bands is The Doors. And then I can remember uh, them talking about recording early women. And uh, obviously that you're thinking, of, you know, the song itself, early women, it must be a, a woman that Jim Morrison was doing. Uh, early women is viewing the city of Los Angeles as a woman that you're right. bidding, bidding farewell to. It's kind of along the same sort of lines, eh? And, uh, but each person... Yeah and take something different from it. That's the beauty of music, I suppose. I mean, look at, if you listen to Jim Morrison's lyrics, they're just a sort of roller coaster eh? Drugs. <laughs> yeah, you just said that it was your own acid when they wrote everything, but, um, but no, it's, uh, love the doors as well. Obviously, you do a lot of songwriting, you do a lot of gigs, a lot of performing. Is, do you prefer songwriting and recording over performing is there, is there one that you prefer or are they both equal that you enjoy um 
I, pr- I probably prefer um, songwriting and, and, and recording because you've sort of got... I mean, technology's come that far right now that you've got a studio at your fingertips. Yeah. You know, if you want strings, you can have strings. Um, you know, if you want a lexicon reverb, you can have it. You know, it's yeah. like... Albeit, and um, there's always debates as to whether they're as good. The, the plugins are as good as the real thing, but um, to, to, to the untrained ear, it's you're, you're never going to know. So I like, I love having the studio, having my wee space where it's just like my wee creative space. I mean, obviously the gigs, the gigs pay the bills, and I, I do have good gigs. Um, but you know yourself, once you've been doing it for sort of 15, 20 years or whatever. Um, is there, e- is there better things I could be doing or is there better ways I could be spending my time? Aye, but it's an easy way to make money, mate. I, I, I cannot lie. I, yeah. I can't think of a, an easier way where I could make as much money for a few hours than, than what I do playing the guitar. And every time that I, I try and uh, talk myself out of gigging or like, oh, should I really still be gigging? It's like, James, you know what I mean? So, some of the gigs I do, people are working a week. <laughs> <laughs> to get that money, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. who am I kidding? So I, I talk myself back into it every time. Obviously, you've done you've done a lot of gigs. Do you still get nervous before a gig? Uh, if it's a new place, I, I get sort of nervous about about it. I just is, is the nerves is the nerves related to like I've been gigging for a long time. And there'll be times where I get nervous. It's not so much about me, because I know them. See, the minute I play that first chord, I know, guitar-wise and vocal-wise, you know, I've got this. I probably get maybe more nervous about, is, is it going to sound good? Is the sound, you know, what's the shape of the, the place? Where am I standing in the pub or in the, the place that I'm playing? Um, I don't get so much nervous about my own ability. It's more about, technical stuff that's maybe out with your control at times but what's it like I would say that um, there's maybe a bit of both Um, I I have total imposter syndrome Um, always have I I still don't know sort of why I get asked back to places um, because I'm not I'm not technical on the guitar you know like I I strum chords I, I like very rarely do I even pick single notes. Like, I'm, I'm sort of strumming. But I think, like, I'm always sort of having the, the inner battle with myself. Like, I think playing drums for all that time helped my rhythm. So I do a lot of sort of stop-start sort of rhythm and, like, muting the strings and, and things like that, which kind of makes up for the, the lack of backing music. Um, and everybody, I got a lot of compliments on it. Great rhythm on that guitar and... You know, I can obviously hold a tune, but um, I've still I've still got the imposter syndrome. Another half of it is going to places and and thinking, you know, what is it going to be like? Is it going to be busy? Is it going to be a rowdy rowdy crowd? Like one of my I I don't know, like throwing out requests. I like, see people come up to me with requests and be like, "Do you know? Smells like Teen Spirit." No, I can sing every word. Just smells like Teen Spirit. Yeah. But could I play it on the guitar? Could I bluff it? I don't think so. Yeah, I, mean, um, I, I had that. I had that just last week, and 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 you get it all the time. You'll you'll have experienced this as well, where somebody will come up and, and they'll either ask for a song that it's a brilliant song, but there's no point playing it because apart from that person, nobody in the pub knows the song. You're going to kill kill the sort of mood that you're trying to create or mm. they'll ask for a song that, and you're like mate it, it, I've only got a guitar it's a great song but you know if you ask for Bohemian Rhapsody the likelihood is it's going to sound rotten if I tried to if it's just me on the guitar because you, there's some songs you just need two or three other guys to add their bits for, to make the song and uh, I think sometimes people don't get that they just think I want to hear this song it's a great song I'll see if we can play it, but you then get obviously the requests for all the bog standard songs that you know people are so sincere when they ask for them because they like the song. But you're like, if I hear that song one more time, oh my god! Uh, 
throw myself like, I, was playing the, I was playing in the Scotsman on Saturday night and there's this one quiet wee woman sitting at the bar and like everybody else was sort of coming up with requests and I, I end up making a joke about it and I like I end up shouting through the mic because somebody will come up and be like uh, can you play uh, Baker Street and I'm like the whole point of Baker Street is the saxophone mate so I'm, <laughs> Aye, uh, so unless I'm through the mic, which I have, I have done, I do it with like uh, Ring of Fire. Uh, but Baker Street's a bit different, so I was like, mate, that's the whole the saxophone hook is the whole song. Oh, right, right, no bother. So this woman came up and she's like, can you play um, This Year's Love by David Gray? And that's Saturday night, mate. Uh, like, I can't even think of a mere sort of depressing song, and it has its time, and I love the song. It has its time and its place. But a Saturday night in the middle of Edinburgh when the, the crowd's bouncing, isn't it? And I'm like, I, that's that's no the tune for a Saturday night, pal. And she was like, please. <laughs> I'm like, so, what, you got anything else? She's like, uh, okay, David Gray, sail away with me. And I'm like, <laughs> it's just like the same tempo. The same sentiment. Yeah. So, uh, ah, yeah, it's, it's tough. And and going back to your original question is, um, I get apprehensive about that because uh, you never, like, maybe it's a nervous excitement because you never know what the night's going to hold in store. And even though you maybe had a couple of rotten gigs at, at one place, you can go in the third week and it's absolutely bouncing and you have a great night. It's funny as well, though, people don't realise that, I mean, you, you don't want the pub to be completely dead, completely empty, but at the same time, a pub can be too busy as well. Aye. Which, which, which sounds silly because you think the busier the better, but a pub, if it's too busy, it can be a nightmare, but it can also be that it's extremely busy but nobody's paying attention. You just want that sort of middle ground where, like see if there's 20 people and the 20 people are loving the music. Brilliant. Right? You could have 60 people and you didn't get one clap after it, any songs because they're no paying attention. So there's just a weird balance that you've got to try and get that sort of middle ground. I'll tell you my best gigs, mate. The one I enjoy the most. I do, like, I'm with a couple of agencies and they put us in hotels, hotel yeah. lobbies, like Double Tree Hilton and, like, Novotels and stuff like that. And they, to me, they're the best gigs because they're never, the hotel lobbies are never crammed. Yeah. But for some reason, it's always a captive audience. They're always intently listening. And, like, you can chat with them and, like, you can hear, they can hear you and you can hear them. And, like, I, I don't know. know. I, just, I, I, really, I really like those. Plus, they're only normally two hours, and I prefer two hour gigs to three hour gigs anyway. <laughs> it might be that thing as well, though, that maybe people are a little bit better behaved. You know, if you're in a pub where, you know, somebody should have stopped getting served an hour ago because they're just too drunk and they're becoming a nuisance. And you know, pub gig, pub gigs are, are they can be tough, but they can also be great fun as well. Just to, it's it's a weird one. Every week can be different. Aye, don't get me wrong. I play pubs and I, I, I do enjoy some of the <coughs> some of the pubs I play in Edinburgh. Um, I was I was saying to you earlier, I, I, I kind of do this thing where. Um, uh, if people come up and ask me for songs, I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know that. Um, and then I'll go into the mic and I'll be like, right, that's one person disappointed tonight. Anybody else want disappointed? Come up, give me your song. If I can't play it, you'll be number two. Uh, and I just, I kind of make a joke here. But James, do you not get it when you say, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have that? But James, it's easy. Aye. <laughs> I Aye. still don't it, but it's easy. Uh, you, you get it literally like no every gig but I mean you, you get boys coming up being like do you know uh, what was it somebody asked me for of monsters and men and I've heard of that like uh, I'm like of monsters and men I was like is that a song and the boys look at me like what it's a band <laughs> and I'm like alright right well you know I've, I've heard the name but I, I don't know he's like you know it and he starts singing it and I'm like Nah, I, I don't know it, mate. And then he pulls out his phone and he's on to Spotify. Is he's that looking you... the song up. He's handing me, like, 
putting the phone up to my ear. And that's just all between in between songs. So like the, the audience are waiting on my next song. Yeah. And there's a, uh, you know, Dave for Chapel Hall, like trying to let me let me listen to his entire Spotify library so I can learn the song. My, my favourite one is when they, see when they um, ask for a song whilst you're in the middle of playing a song. It, it looks as if it doesn't register with them that the sound that they're hearing is you actually playing. Like I had a, I was playing through in Berlin just a few weeks ago and it's it's a, a relatively new place that's been bought over and there's a it's a wee stage that you play on so there's like two or three steps up onto the stage so you're, you're obviously above everyone and uh, so normally you would expect even less for people to come up because you're already on a stage this person walked up onto the stage whilst I'm in the middle of the plane to ask if I knew this song from their Spotify list and I'm like mate I'm <laughs> actually playing the new you need to wait at least wait until in between a song Turned out I didn't know it anyway, but uh, <laughs> that is that. But obviously we've got um, the Kaiser, which I'm guessing is obviously your solo stuff that you're writing mm-hmm. all your material. Are you, is that a band or is that just yourself? Um, I've been obviously releasing stuff as as myself. Probably no while I was with Signar because it, all my focus went into into that but I was still writing stuff that I would take to the guys and they would be like "Ah, I don't think it's quite for a rock band or it's not really your style so um, I'd still be putting them out under my my name James Mackay Um, and then it kind of got to a stage where like I I, I said this to you the last time I was getting all these people adding me and messaging me and that saying uh, like where can I find your song like uh Rue hunting fucking putting pine dog and I'm like what? Like and it turns out there's a guy in Australia called James Mackay, exact same spelling, and he writes sort of comedy songs about um hunting pigs and kangaroos. Right, okay. And uh, he's got he's got these uh two he's got these two or three dogs that he takes out and, and hunts hunts these pigs and kangaroos with. Um and then folk were like coming onto my music page uh, and, and I was getting all these ads and <laughs> and I look at the profile picture and it's like a guy holding up three rabbits and that and like I'm like what what's going on here? And then I eventually had a conversation with the guy. <laughs> he ended up messaging me saying, You're James Mackay, people keep mistaking me for you and I was like, funny. I was like, people keep mistaking me for you as well. Um so there was also a guy from London who plays folk music and he's called James Mackay with the exact same spelling. So my mate always called me Mackayser and I was like, I'm gonna change it to that just just because it's it's and I looked up you know that thing where you do the search MacKaiser nothing comes up I'm like a beauty um, so it is me um, who write who's writing the songs um, but I've had a couple of the Cyanar guys uh, Martin and Croft the drummer and the bassist they played on my first single Cassie and we have a wee rehearsal now and again just sort of jamming through some of, some of my songs but my latest, the latest one that I'm putting out is coming out on the third day, third day May, is all me and a guy I met in Nashville um, five years ago who's playing the <laughs> playing the lead guitar uh, on it. So um, that's yeah, it's me featuring John Todd from Napa Valley in California. There, well, there you go then, other side of the world. That's brilliant. Um, again, technology, and it's just like I sent him over a an MP3, and he sent me um, WAV files back. I just popped them straight in, panned them left and right, wee bit of EQ. Bob's your uncle. It was it's brilliant. It's funny you say that because uh, one of the the episodes that I just a, a couple of episodes ago, I think it was, there's a, a rock band from uh, they originated in Australia. And uh, they'd moved to America, to Los Angeles. They'd got signed on a couple of albums, and then for whatever reason, it, 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 they kind of split up. And um, I've managed to try, I'm trying to track down all the guys in the band, and I've managed to get four of the five. And I, the last guy that I was speaking to was the drummer. And I was saying, you know, what, what, what is it you're doing with yourself nowadays? And we're kind of talking away. And I'd, I'd spoke with him afterwards, 
And I was like, mate, do you, do you do any session work? And he's like, yeah, yeah, you know, he'd be open for it. And that, so we were in talks of, you know, I've got, I've got a bunch of songs and that, but I was like, I, I don't, I know how I want the drums to sound, but I, I don't play the drums. You know, I, I couldn't do it justice. And I thought, you know what, that, how cool would it be to actually get a, a guy from a band that you listen to to record the drums for you? And, Hi. Uh, and it's, it's a thought, it's, it's in my head now, so it's just a thought at the moment, but I did speak to him about it and he was up for it. And, uh, but I mean, you're talking about the other side of the world, like Australia. And like, you could actually, just the way technology is, you, you know, you could have half of, you know, you've got your drums recorded possibly in Australia, and then you've got the rest of the music recorded in Scotland. It's like, it's crazy, but it, it's yeah. pretty cool. But, uh, I went on to, uh, like, I d- you heard the Fiverr, Fiverr.com. It's a website where you can basically, uh, there's so many services you can choose for, for a Fiverr. So it could be like digital content creation, yeah, like, you know, <laughs> letter editing. But you can also get like, uh, there's guys on there who will play on your track. And I remember like, maybe about five or six years ago thinking, I'd like some cello on this this track. And uh, so I went on to Facebook and I was like, I'm looking for a cello player to come in and uh, put put cello down on my track and not one reply. <laughs> uh, there seems to be a lot more replies for stuff like that now because I see a lot of their posts and there's always folk re- responding to them, but I didn't get any response at the time. So we're only Fiverr.com and I was like, cello players, this guy, he was in the Ukraine. Yeah. I messaged them, I'm like, how much would you take to put cello down on my track? Like three minutes. And it worked out about 32 quid or something like that. And Nothing. I was like, but I, I, and I got it back and I was like, holy, what? I was like, that sounds brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> I just, so I, my, my track featured a, a, a cello player for the, the Ukraine. It's crazy, man, but I love it. It is cool. Technology, it, it's bad in some ways, but it is brilliant. Uh, in other ways but James we've been obviously super serious so we're going to have some fun questions before we end this and uh, you'll kind of know what the questions might be um, so I'm expecting some good answers here <laughs> right so <laughs> imagine you could go back in time anywhere in the world what's the one gig concert that you wish that you could have attended could have been from years ago before you were even born What's the one gig or concert you you just think that would have been amazing to be in the audience witnessing the, them playing this gig? Um, there would probably there would probably be a few. <coughs> I mean, I've had to. I would have liked to have seen Live Aid. That, yeah. that would have been pretty cool because there was so many like iconic acts sort of played there. Maybe, um, but maybe depending on where you were in the crowd. <laughs> That's true, I um I, I think I gave the same answer as I did last time, mate. Um it's probably the not the most boring gig, but like I wish I had been on the rooftop in nineteen sixty nine when the Beatles done their final concert. Yeah. I mean I'll listen I'll listen to that. I'll like go onto YouTube and I I'll listen to the, the rooftop concert. On repeat, I don't know. And it's just uh, I fell in love with it, and uh, yeah. So if that was, if there was ever going to be a concert that I could have attended throughout history, I would have been perched on that rooftop. Rooftop. I would have been the guy hodding John Lennon's lyrics yep. <laughs> underneath the microphone. Easy though, because imagine, imagine being able to go back. Imagine you had a time machine, so you go back. You already know that you'd be witnessing something that's historic. Imagine just being there at the time, like you, you didn't know that what you were witnessing was. It was just maybe another gig. You know, it's crazy. Like, it must be cool all these years later if you attended Live Aid or if you attended, you know, whatever it was. And all these years later, you can be like, I was at that. You know, I've been to a million gigs. I don't know if any of them, you know, would be remembered in like 30 years time as being anything spectacular. I mean, they were all brilliant gigs, but they weren't historical gigs. Things like maybe having been in King Tut's when 
Oasis seemingly barged her way on to the, the stage and performed a three or four song set and then sort of they met Alan McGee who missed his train that day and that's the only reason he was in King Tuts and you know that that kind of historical gig or like I don't know the Stone Roses at Spike Island or something like that you know <laughs> yeah um, I mean the Beatles it is for me yeah I mean it'd be interesting what about obviously you you know you, you sing play the guitar any instruments that you wish that you could play that, that you currently don't I wish I could play lead guitar, mate. I really wish that... Um, I mean, I, I'm honestly sitting here looking at one, two, three, four, five electric guitars here. Yeah. And I love the look I love the look of them. I just wish I could play them to the, to the best of my ability, but... Maybe, maybe just, there's, there's still time. There is still time, aye. So electric guitar, like, to, like lead guitar and... Um, I'd like to play the piano better. Yeah. And uh, James, there's millions and millions of amazing songs that have been written over the years by different artists. Is there a particular song that you wish that you could have sat in, at the recording desk in the studio witnessing it being recorded? Um, I think... Again, any of the Beatles stuff, mate. But um, like, yeah. uh, you like see the Beatles' first session where they recorded the entire album in twelve hours. I mean, that would have just seen the dynamic. Eh? Because I'm a, a, a massive fan, and like um, George uh, George Martin had obviously taken a bit of a chance in the Beatles, and he was the he was the the gaffer, and the Beatles came in, and then. You know, as we all know, the dynamic sort of there was still the respect, but the dynamic shift quick, uh, quickly shifted. Um, so I'd love to have been in there for that. I would also love to have been in the studio when they were recording rumours, Fleetwood Mac. I mean, not that that whole story about are they in fighting and they them all sort of sleeping with each other and the amount of drugs that were consumed and stuff. I think that would have been quite a quite an interesting time to be in the studio <laughs> to watch the band. <laughs> I think some of the older bands, it would have probably been even cooler because a lot of the older bands simply went in, they mic'd everything up and, and it was recorded live in the studio rather than nowadays where it's maybe layered up. You know, you'll do the drums first, get the bass, get the guitars and all that. A lot of the older bands, what you're hearing is the band playing live in the recording studio. Aye. Uh, been cool to win. There's just some stuff that would have been cool. Or maybe even maybe uh, Wish You Were Here, Pink Floyd when Sid Barrett decided to have a wee visit and was uh, <laughs> just Aye. crazy. And they were, they were, sing they were singing about him. <laughs> uh, Aye. Last question as well for you, James. Mount Rushmore, who is your top four artists or musicians for, you, for yourself as perfection? Um, perfection. Let's go away. Kylie and Jason. Yeah. <laughs> now we're back together forever. Um, nah, seriously, it would probably be, um, it'd probably be the same as uh, as I gave the last time. Has I, I say? I'm sure I said to you the last time that um, it would. Uh, it probably changes a lot, but thinking about it, it, it does not. So my Mount Rushmore. Freddie Mercury. Yep. John, John Lennon. Yep. Bruce Springsteen. Yep, one more. <laughs> uh, Mercury, Springsteen, Lennon. Oh, who did I say the last time? This is going to... Because gonna, I bet you've still got the footage. I bet you'll go back and be like, ah, he's a lion, but... <laughs> But did you not say Gav Hines? <laughs> Gav Hines is the fourth one. Uh, no, that's honestly, I, I don't know. Like but Bowie, Elvis, maybe. I mean, I, I, I love the King, like, but um, he wasn't a writer. I like writers. Was it not Billy David Joel? David Bowie. Was that? Was it David Bowie? No, it was Billy Joel. Billy Joel. And then it was Gav. So, Gav was not uh, then it, 
<laughs> then, it, then it was Gav Hines sort of peeking at the top of Mount Rushmore, ready to unleash a killer bass run. Uh, Pushing them out the way, machine gun in them, he's based. <laughs> I'm sure. I, I'm sure I've got like um, footage of Gav at rehearsal somewhere. Like, honestly, there wasn't a wall he didn't bounce off. Um, when Gav starts playing, you just stand back and admire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was it was a great process. Like, good days, good memories. But James, thank you for coming on again. If this one doesn't work, I'm giving up. <laughs> Well, third, t- third time lucky, mate. Um, I just says to the missus before I came in there, she's like, "Are you going to? Is he going to ask you the same questions and stuff again?" I was like, "I don't care. It's talking music for an hour." I was like, "It's, it's what I live for." So, uh, you know, if, if this one buggers up, I'll be back again in a couple of weeks. Like, Ian, when are we booking up again? <laughs> but no, well, hopefully, mate. hopefully it works this time, mate. Well, that's fine. But thanks for coming on, James. Wish you all the success in the future with the tunes. I'll keep a wee eye out. And uh, I'm going to try and get along to a gig as well. Cheer you on, or, or boo you if you're if you're rotten. <laughs> Wait, I saw, saw the banter, mate. Saw saw the Glasgow banter. Uh, um, no, it's been great to talk to you again, mate. And uh, loving what you're doing, uh, sort of shining a light on unsigned artists and some signed artists, I believe. So, um, I I wish you all the best, my man. Cool, man. Until next time. Cheers, pal. Take care, my man. Cheers. Cheers.